Well, welcome back everyone. Session two is just about to start. The first thing we're going to do is show a video of patients describing their journey from symptoms to diagnosis. And then we will have some more speakers to delight us with their information. I think I had my cough for over a year before I went to a GP. It was just a little irritating cough, but I'd had it a long time, so I thought I'd better get it checked out. I saw a doctor about uh, six, six or seven years after it started because it was increasing all the time. Over a two or three years, it got progressively worse and I could feel myself being slightly more breathless and having problems wheezing up the hill, for example. So I did go to my GP, who was very uh, open, and he immediately sent me to the local uh, asthma clinic. I mean, that's the automatic reaction. You've got, you've got asthma. So, so yeah, with the mouse release, angefangen hat, das war ganz uh, schleichend, ganz uh, no so. <clears throat> Ja, und dann wurde es äh, nachher immer mehr und mehr. Äh, ich dachte, naja, vielleicht doch eine Pollenallergie, aber war es keine. Es äh, wurden von äh, verschiedenen Ärzten äh, Allergietests gemacht. Ja, wie es ging weiter, dann war es immer mehr und mehr unangenehm. Äh, wie gesagt, ich war beim äh, Hausarzt. Äh, Ich war beim HNO-Arzt, ich war bei einer Lungenärztin, da wurde der Thorax ähm, und, äh, geranscht. Well, I've seen my family doctor and he sent me to a specialist. This, this guy was a respiratory uh, specialist and it, he started a lot of investigation with different exams, going through uh, the digestion, going through uh, the, the, the lungs. Well, everything, about uh, 15 different exams, you know. I initially had chest X-ray. I think I had some dye um, to have some sort of scan in my throat, uh, blood tests. They all seemed fine. Over the years, at different intervals, I've had tube down my throat, spirometry tests for asthma, Ventolin, taking Ventolin every so often and then checked how that affected my breathing. I've had a tube into my stomach for 24 hours, checked for a stomach acid. I've gone quite a lot of years and not been to a GP. I've had big gaps when I've just not gone because really nobody seemed to come up with any answers. Then I went to the family doctor. The family doctor said, okay, we have to, to cancel your, your medicine and we take another one, but there was no impact to the, to the cuff. Now I'm here at the lung doctor, and then we, we did also the, again, the, the x-ray check and another lung test. But as I know, there was nothing there to see that there is uh, anything wrong. Uh, I went and I had all the sort of I had tests for every allergy under the sun at the asthma clinic. And then I had those sort of breathing tests where you puff into things. And I had a, another lung x-ray. And I was diagnosed with having some asthma that, with narrowing airways and some limited, you know, reduction in my breathing capacity. And I kept returning to the asthma clinic over a period, I suppose, of, I don't know, two, three, four years and seeing the same specialist but still having the cough. I mean, the cough was no better, basically. And I always felt also at the asthma, at the asthma clinic, it was so busy. And she, you know, sometimes we'd have an appointment that was nearly seven o'clock at night and you could see this poor woman was tired, exhausted. And I thought, well, she's got no time to think outside the box or to give me any extra sort of support. So I did ask my GP if I could re be referred to Toulouse as a, and a teaching hospital. So I was lucky because I was put in touch with Dr. Gilemino, 
Um, and it was at that time the only cough clinic. I, I think that was a sort of a sort of a turning moment for me, not in terms of doing anything specific at that time that would go to improve my cough, but at talking to somebody who was interested in cough specifically. And he said to me, you have what we call a hypersensitive cough. You, it is a cough. It is something in its own right. And he did say, well, we don't have any different medications at the moment, but people are beginning to get interested in it and look at it. And it, for me, it was such a relief. It, it's, it's been great, actually. It's been great just having a listening ear. I just thought I had a, a very persistent niggling cough. But various people told me that I ought to go and have it checked out. And sort of 30 years later, I visited almost every um, London hospital, um, being referred to for all sorts of different uh, diagnoses, some um, false, well, many of them false, thanks to um, being referred to the cough clinic at King's College Hospital. That really um, opened my eyes to the fact that my cough or my symptoms were recognised as recognisable problem. I don't think chronic cough was really mentioned when I first was diagnosed, I don't remember. I think a few years into having it, my GP did say to me, he didn't really know what it was and he didn't really think it, they could stop it. And well, there was nothing that could give me at that time, only inhalers and things. Uh, he did say he didn't think it was harmful in a sense long term because he felt it was a reaction that I was having and it was a natural thing to cough. I think he was just really trying to put me at ease so that I wasn't worried. What would I like doctors to know? I'd like, uh, I'd like laboratories to find a medication that's a good medication and not killing us with something else. Well, I'd like it to be acknowledged as a sickness because it's really very tiring sometimes. Although it must be on my records, it never seems to be mentioned when I go to the GP, if I've got some other illness. If you had any other illness, say diabetes or, or something that you were living with all the time, I think it would be, it, somebody might say, well, how's it going and how are you? But it never comes up unless I bring it up, that I've got my cough. And sometimes I do say, well, I've got my cough as well, because I don't think people realise, you know, when you're not, when you've got something that you have all the time, and then you get poorly on top of it, it's just a bit of an added irritation, I suppose. But I think if GPs and asthma specialists all knew that there is something separate, it would shorten the journey as it were just the real message is treat it seriously the, the, the key thing is still that listening and understanding and being able to tell somebody give a name to something just testing breathing testing lungs and reassuring people that it's not some other disease i mean i think that's the key thing also is you know a lot of people have an awful lot of anxiety that it could be lung, lung cancer or it could be, you know, some other chronic disease. Letting them know that, no, a cough is, a, is something and it's debilitating. But if you're diagnosed with cough and you ruled out everything else, you can live with cough. So, uh, dear uh, participants, I hope uh, you can hear me. Uh, I just like to introduce our first speaker in this session. Um, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Marta Dabrowska. Uh, uh, she is going uh, to be explaining the doctor's view of diagnosing chronic cough. It is a real uh, big problem. Uh, in my eyes, I uh, do it as well. And uh, you could hear uh, Lorcan uh, uh, told you uh, that there are uh, specific conditions uh, which has to be, uh, have to be diagnosed because um, they have uh, probably uh, appropriate uh, treatments. Uh, 
many cases uh, will not, not yet. Uh, I would uh, especially thank uh, Dr. Dabrowska uh, for stepping in to cover this talk at the last minute. Uh, Marta, please. Uh, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am very happy that I can be with today with you at the first uh, Chronic of Patients conference and that I can share some information about uh, uh, diagnosing chronic cough. Uh, I am a respiratory uh, physician and allergologist, and I work in the cough center at Medical University of Warsaw in Poland. Uh, I just share my presentation. Uh, I hope everything is well seen. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, one one minute, please. Okay, now now I hope everything is well seen. So uh, the goals for the management of chronic cough, as we heard, uh, are similar but not quite the same for patients and uh, the doctors. Uh, there are some differences. For the patients, the goals of management are to exclude a serious disease, to eliminate cough if it's possible, to avoid cough complications, and to improve their quality of life. At the same time, patients usually wish to limit the therapy and to avoid side effects of drugs if it's possible. From the doctor's point of view, at the beginning, it's important to exclude alarm symptoms, such as red flag symptoms, uh, and thus excluding serious diseases, such as chronic infections, uh, interstitial lung diseases, or cancer. Then it's important to diagnose the cause of cough. It, it can be identified to decrease cough, but not necessarily to eliminate it completely. To avoid complications and to improve patient's quality of life, that's in common with the patients. Uh, our attitude to chronic cough has changed with time, what was reflected in uh, our doctor's consecutive cough guidelines. About 20, 30 years ago, we treated chronic cough mainly as a symptom of different diseases. But later on, we see that it's an effect of cough reflex hypersensitivity and uh, in, uh, that it is an in effect of inadequate inhibition of cough reflex. The recent Euro European Respiratory Society guidelines for management of chronic cough emphasize a shift in our understanding of chronic cough. Uh, we consider chronic cough not only as a symptom of different diseases now, but also as an effect of hypersensitivity uh, of cough reflex and its inadequate inhibition. At the beginning of uh, our diagnostics, let's focus on the alarm sign symptoms, that means so-called red flag symptoms. They are numerous and they should be uh, excluded at the beginning of the patient's journey. These are hemoptysis, change in chronic cough character in patients with relevant smoking history, shortness of breath, systemic symptoms such as weight loss or fever, trouble with swallowing, especially if it, it, in, if it increases, hoarseness or voice disturbances which are increasing, recurrent airway infections. If any of these red flag symptoms exist, the patient goes another journey and should be referred for additional tests. But if they are absent, these are the patients that we are dealing with cough uh, center. Successful treatment of cough allows us to eliminate cough and thus to decrease the odds for complications of cough. And this spectrum of potential complications of cough is enormous. It starts with uh, cardiovascular complications, neurological, gastrointestinal, muscle compli uh, uh, complications, urinary incontinence, and obviously uh, with respiratory complications. If we decrease cough, we 
decrease the chance to any complications and thus improve uh, patients. That means yours quality of your uh, of life. Uh, the recent guidelines try to simplify and shorten the journey of patients with chronic cough, but there are some points that are necessary. And uh, at the beginning, history taking uh, uh, with assessment of risk factors and physical examinations uh, are the key elements on the first visit uh, uh, at cough clinic. Chest X-ray and spirometry are the, both the mandatory additional tests which are usually done in patients with chronic cough. Uh, the diagnosis uh, is um, based on follow-up history taking, including cough duration, cough triggers, smoking history, medications, comorbidities, allergies, coexisting symptoms such as shortness of breath, wheezing, heartburn, regurgitation, running nose, nasal congestion, post-nasal drip syndrome, and others. They allow us to suspect any triggers or find triggers of chronic cough and when eliminating them to reduce uh, the intensity of chronic cough. At the first visit, we usually uh, measure the cough intensity using a visual analog scale. Sometimes simple scores, uh, score from 1 to 10 is used instead or cough severity diary. Next, impact of chronic cough is measured and uh, qualify, uh, is measured uh, um, the impact of chronic cough on quality of life. And we usually use a dedicated questionnaires uh, for that, usually in Europe, less to cough questionnaire. And finally, physical examination is a very important um, point uh, to reveal the cause or trigger of chronic cough. And all these things are usually um, performed during the first visit of patients at chronic cough. And usually some of them are performed before by general uh, practitioners or any other specialists. Uh, the chest x-ray is the key test in the diagnostic pathway of patients with chronic cough uh, because if it's uh, abnormal, uh, it usually indicates that the cause of cough uh, is uh, maybe a chronic infection, uh, interstitial lung diseases, bronchic disease, lung cancer, and some others. Uh, however, if uh, uh, chest x-ray is normal, we concentrate our diagnostic on other diseases. In active smokers uh, with chronic cough, we suspect bronchitis or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. While in non-smoking adults, we usually diagnose asthma, gastroesophageal reflux disease as a trigger rather than reason of cough, and upper airway cough syndrome. Uh, these are the most common triggers of chronic cough. Sometimes cough may be a side effect of some antihypertensive drugs, uh, so-called inhibitors of angiotensin converting enzymes, such as enalapril, ramipril, perindopril, and many others. These are very popular uh, drugs. Uh, in such case, these drugs should be stopped and replaced by other group of antihypertensive drugs. Uh, there are Few other tests useful in diagnosing chronic cough. Among them, the most important, the number one is spirometry with reversibility test, which allow us to diagnose chronic obstructive pulmonary disease if abnormal. And sometimes it allows us to diagnose asthma, classic, uh, uh, classic asthma. Uh, the other tests uh, are equally important, I mean fractional exhaled nitric oxide test and blood um, uh, cell count for eosinophils. Both of these tests indicate uh, eosinophilic inflammation in the airways, and this might be a quite good uh, predictor of a successful response uh, when uh, inhaled steroids uh, are uh, used. According to the uh, 
recent European Respiratory Society guidelines, the next step in diagnosing chronic cough is a trial of empiric uh, of initial therapy. We recommend uh, to stop risk factors if we find any, such as uh, smoking, exposure to cough triggers uh, at work, or uh, using uh, hyperten anti-hypertensive drugs that I mentioned before. Uh, but then if we suspect asthma or non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis, if we have any proof for any uh, eosinophilic airway uh, inflammation, we usually try uh, uh, inhaled, sometimes even oral corticosteroids, followed by antileukotrients. Uh, and we, this therapy is uh, very limited in time. It should take two to four weeks and continued only if it is effective. On the other hand, if we uh, uh, if peptic symptoms are present and uh, coexisting with cough with chronic cough, a trial of diet plus proton pump inhibitors may be recommended, but is not recommended every time. If empiric treatment is effective, it should be continued. But otherwise, if it is ineffective, we should stop it after two or four weeks and that's what very uh, and that's something new because uh, in the past many of patients were treated with ineffective drugs for a very long time unfortunately the efficacy of treatment of chronic cough is limited among all adults with chronic cough five to ten percent patients do not respond to any any or to most of uh, antitussis therapies, while this proportion increases when we see patients at the cup clinics. Uh, unsatisfactory uh, response to antitussis therapy refers to two situations. The first, if reasons of chronic cough is established, but treatment is ineffective. In such case, we call it a refractory chronic cough. And the second situation, if a trigger or cause of chronic cough is not identified despite diagnostics, and then we call it unexplained chronic cough. Both problems, unexplained chronic cough and refractory chronic cough, are very common, and that's what the problem in treating the uh, chronic cough. If chronic cough does not decrease despite the initial therapy, further tests may be considered but are not obligatory. At the same time, we try to treat uh, the uh, hypersensitivity of cough reflex. That means the refractory chronic cough or uh, uh, idiopathic chronic cough, but the treatment will be the subject of next presentations. I just want to mention the other tests that may be sometimes useful in diagnosing rare or uncommon reasons of chronic cough. Uh, among these tests, uh, we uh, use uh, induced sputum analysis for diagnosing non-asthmatic osinopic bronchitis. We use quite often bronchial provocation tests to precisely diagnose cough variant asthma. Sometimes, but not often, we use chest computer tomography when we suspect bronchiectasis or interstitial lung diseases. Uh, we ask our uh, colleagues, CNT specialists, for a, a video laryngoscopy if we suspect vocal cord dysfunction, which is quite often, or we, when we see the swallowing disturbances. Uh, we uh, use sometimes polysomnography when we suspect obstructive sleep apnea, and we use some tests for uh, esophagia um, diagnostics. I'm, uh, recently, we used uh, pH and, uh, iso uh, and impedance monitoring, and now esophageal manometry is recommended. Uh, the, some of these tests may be useful, but not always, and they should not be uh, performed in every patient, especially if the cough persists. This is the present approach to diagnose chronic cough in adults, according to the recent European guidelines. And the treatment of chronic cough will be discussed in the next presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marta, especially that you stepped in 
such late notice and everybody has found that incredibly interesting and I know that I'll go back and look at all your slides again because there was so much information to take in so thank you very much. Now um, we're now going to see some videos of patients explaining about the treatment they've tried for chronic cough and I would just like to say thank you to all these people who we've recorded with their heartfelt feeling you know the way they have um, approached their chronic cough and explained it to us is just very edifying for me so over to our patients again to tell us what the um, treatments they've found. Ja, probieren Sie es mit Cortison. Oft ist es so, ja, dann habe ich auch Cortison inhaliert und es äh, wurde nicht besser. Ja, dann äh, nach der Gastroskopie habe ich äh, Omeprazol genommen, äh, ganz viele Tage lang wurde nicht gebessert. Äh, dann habe ich es mit, mit Nexium probiert, ganz große Packung. Auch, also hat sich auch nicht gebessert. Dann habe ich probiert mit äh, Lutschtabletten, die helfen, kann man sagen, noch mit, bei, bei so einem äh, Hustenanfall. Das, wird, das äh, bessert sich dann kurzfristig. Äh, Verschiedene Sprays auch genommen, bronchoerweiternde äh, Substanzen, Corticosteroide. Äh, over the years, I've been given various things to try and ease my cough. I was given morphine quite early on, about four years in, I think, uh, which did help. It did, once it stopped my cough, it definitely helped. It definitely um, eased the cough. But I just couldn't take it. it. It was like being in a constant daze. And it also gave me heart palpitations, which the doctor actually said it shouldn't have done. But it definitely did, because they went when I stopped taking it. Probably morphine works because it was relaxing my whole body, I presume. Um, I've had lots of on and offs with antiacids. Inhalers, I've had different ones at different times. I still take, always have my Ventolin inhaler with me. Because I just think I've got mild asthma. And there are occasions when I've been coughing and I've really thought I can't get my breath because you stop breathing after a while when you're coughing so bad. I think about just over a year ago, uh, Professor Guillamino put me onto oxycodone and the two a day gave me immediate, very good relief, actually. They, but they did make me, I did find, find I was getting drowsy and they did make me constipated. So I cut, I decided I would cut it down to one a day just at night. And actually that's fundamentally made a huge difference because I don't cough at night. Because the first time he gave me some treatment for the lungs, anyway, he gave me that and I developed an allergy to it. So I, even though I told him it's not my lungs, my lungs are okay, it's here. <laughs> but well, of course he had to go through the whole, the whole stuff to make sure he wasn't forgetting anything. I've been on clinical trials. I, I was on clinical trials for about a year. I can't say any of the drugs made any difference, but that was quite early on in my cough as well, when it wasn't as bad or as frequent as it is now. I've been on a number of different trials, some of which have been quite encouraging, uh, but the most encouraging one um, has just recently been deemed to be no more effective um, than the placebo was, which was really disappointing. I had great hopes for that. Uh, but the trial, I had the placebo. <laughs> I knew it wasn't making any very much difference. I was hoping, I think. Um, but it was very interesting to be part of the trial. I, I enjoyed the experience. 
but it is quite a commitment because of logging everything every single day. I've not really tried any alternative treatments. My husband keeps suggesting I should go to a hypnotist to learn how to relax, to learn relaxation techniques. And I just cannot, I don't think I would just like to feel out of control at a hypnotist. I tried CBD. I tried it because they said it, it was a, 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 something that calmed people, that helped them to sleep etc etc so i tried it to no avail didn't work at all so i stopped then i tried uh, the relaxing the relaxing exercises which don't work with me because i'm too nervous I hypnosis which they, nobody can hypnotize me um and things like that which don't work the, the whole breathing strategy thing is fine if you knew the cough was coming on and you could anticipate it and start doing some breathing but the problem is when it's spontaneous once you've started coughing it doesn't matter how much you you're sort of holding it back but you're not actually calming it it's it, it you know you hold it back for the number of seconds that you'll practice the breathing and then as soon as you stop woof, you're coughing again <laughs> you know people love to tell you what you should be trying um, that's not the same as you know talking to somebody who's trying something and and it's worked I'd be interested in any personal research into things that have worked for people. Uh, auch Physiotherapie wurde empfohlen. Uh, man sollte auch uh, versuchen, ganz langsam zu schlucken, also die, die uh, Flüssigkeiten ganz langsam zu schlucken, damit, uh, damit die Magensäure uh, unten bleibt, aber alles ohne Erfolg. I've tried a lot of dietary things on my own, of my own, but I'm at the moment not having milk because I just think that makes me have more phlegm or fluid or something. I don't know, but I do find that is helping. I've tried going gluten free. I've tried a few dietary things over the years, but ultimately none of them really help. Manuka honey, tried that. I think in the past I've probably tried things related to diet, you know, cutting out wheat or cutting out whatever, or, you know, I find it hard to cut out things that I really like eating, you know. There is one thing that I've been thinking of. I wonder if it's not um, uh, nervous origin, I mean, neurological origin. Like if something was um, some neurological message was getting to this part, which is maybe it's the the uh, the cords or uh, whatever it is. Most of the time, people say it's in your head. Yeah, it might be in our head, but neurologically speaking, you know, the best treatment is recognition. I mean, definitely the best treatment for anybody. Is somebody saying yes you've got this and you're not it's not a figment of your imagination there's probably some scientific reason for us to have a cough like we have but sometimes i do wonder if it is partly me am i should i relax more can i control it in some way would some therapy help i don't wonder that it would be nice to try something different but ultimately a little of me has given up trying and I just live with it because it drives me mad trying to find an answer. Hello, uh, we are a little bit behind the schedule. Um, I uh, have to announce uh, our next speaker. Um, um, next speaker is Professor Laurent Guiminot, uh, who is going to be describing the current drug treatments uh, for chronic cough. Uh, professor Guiminot is a professor uh, of medicine um, at the Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Toulouse. Um, uh, in France, and uh, he runs a cough uh, clinic in Toulouse. Uh, please, 
start your uh, presentation. Thank you, Peter. It's a great pleasure to be here today and attend this first patient's meeting. Um, I will present you the current drug treatments in Kronikov. My uh, disclosure of interest, I have no disclosure of interest with this presentation. I will talk about the current drugs of Kronikov and I will focus my talk on Kronikov with normal physical exam and normal um, chest imaging. I mean, as Marta told you, chronic cough can be associated with chronic lung diseases like lung cancer or interstitial disease, but I won't have time to discuss the current drug treatment for those diseases. So I will focus my talk on chronic cough with physical exam, normal physical exam and normal chest imaging. Before detailing the current drug treatments we have in Kronikov, I would like to discuss the objectives of the treatments because for clinicians, it's very important to know the objective we should achieve for the patients before initiating a treatment. And I think that the most important objective is to improve the quality of life and particularly the psychosocial component of quality of life. Unfortunately, we do not have many tools for the assessment. What we have is the visual analog scale, the, the line, the 10, 10 centimeters line and the patients indicate the cough severity on this line. We uh, we also have the Leicester cough questionnaire. It's a questionnaire with 19 questions. And he, only in research centers, we have cough monitor for the recording of the cough frequency. Unfortunately, it's only available in research centers. I will divide my talk into two parts the first step treatment and the second step treatment. For the first step treatment, Marta details the factors and the main diseases associated with chronic cough. And the first step is to identify and treat those factors and those diseases associated with chronic cough. For example, drugs like ACE inhibitors can trigger chronic cough. And the first step is to discontinue those drugs. Tobacco plays a key role in chronic cough. So in the first step, the smoking cessation is crucial for improve chronic cough. Regarding the uh, other main diseases, as Martha said, um, questioning, discussion, physical exams are very important in the diagnostic management of chronic cough. And in a situation of symptoms of asthma or reflux disease of rhinosinusitis, a specific treatment should be initiated, like inhaled treatment in asthma or anti-reflux treatment in reflux disease. However, um, there was a discussion about the anti-acid drugs and the American guidelines, the European guidelines recommend not to routinely use anti-acid drugs in patients with chronic cough. Those drugs should be restricted to patients with symptoms of reflux, like heartburn or regurgitation. However, the anti-acid drugs should not be prescribed in patients with chronic cough. Unfortunately, those drugs treatments are widely used in patients with chronic cough, and we know that those drugs do not um, have an impact on chronic cough in clinical practice. At the opposite, the ERS guidelines 
suggest a short-term inhaled steroid trial in patients with chronic cough. In fact, in some patients, there is a high effect of inhaled steroid treatments in patients with chronic cough. And given the good safety profile of those drugs treatments, it's interesting to try uh, those treatments. And if it's effective, those, this treatment can be continued. Unfortunately, some patients have persistent cough despite this first step treatment. And in patients, some do not have cause of chronic cough despite investigations, or the optimal treatment, the specific treatments I told earlier is not, uh, are not effective in, in, in the causes. So some patients experience refractory chronic cough. I mean, persistent cough, despite uh, an optimal first step treatment. As you can see on this picture, the, the big cycle, blue cycle is chronic cough. Some patients have arguments for diseases, but they have no improvement of cough despite the treatment. And some patients have no causes of cough and they have refractory chronic cough. And as um, Stuart Mazzoni explained earlier, there is a neurological dysfunction in these patients, probably. It's why the treatment of refractory chronic cough is mainly based on neuromodulators. Unfortunately, no drugs have been approved for chronic cough yet, but the recommendation evoked the possibility to use off-label drugs treatments in chronic cough, I mean neuromodulators. We have two classes of neuromodulators in chronic cough. The first class is pregabalin and gabapentin. They are used in neuropathic, neuropathic pain, um, and they act on the communication between two nerves. It's called the synapse, and there is a modulation in the message of cough. I mean the neurological message of cough with uh, this treatment. It's the same with the second class, morphine. It uh, plays a role in, um, it's a painkiller, you know morphine, everyone knows morphine, um, and it's used in, in, in chronic cough. Um, other treatments are um, used in clinical practice, but have not been recommended yet. Amitriptyline, antihistamines, first generation of antihistamines, and antibiotics. The ERS guidelines recommend a trial of low-dose morphine in patients with refractory chronic cough. There was one study in the literature. As you can see uh, on, on the graph, the patients were randomized for placebo or low-dose morphine. And as you can see, here is the cough score, the time. There is no change of the cough score, the cough score with placebo but there is a decrease in the cough score with morphine. And as you can see, there is no uh, disappearance, disappearance of, of cough with, with morphine. The RS guidelines recommend as well a trial of gabapentin or pregabalin in patients with chronic cough. And there was one study in the literature with gabapentin. As you can see on this graph, the LCQ score improved with gabapentin, and there was no change with uh, placebo. And for the visual analog scale, there was an improvement with gabapentin and no change with placebo. As Alan Morris said uh, previously, in my experience, the effect is not very 
high and it's a bit disappointing to be honest in clinical practice. As a conclusion, I would like to highlight the importance of the first step treatment in patients with chronic cough because sometimes it's skipped by physicians and it's important to treat the main factors and the main diseases that is as that are associated with chronic cough. Unfortunately, there are no approved drugs treatments in chronic cough and particularly refractory chronic cough. Neuromodulators can be effective in some patients and should be used. And I would like to highlight the, important, the importance of non-pharmacological intervention because there is a synergy with drug treatments. And I think uh, Professor Anne Vertigan will speak about um, speech pathologists because it's very helpful in, in clinical practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Laurent. I know that your words will be of great interest to everyone who's listening, so um, thank you very much. And you've highlighted that our next speaker is Professor Anne Vertigan. And uh, Professor Vertigan is the manager of speech pathology for John Hunter Hospital and Belmont Hospital in Newcastle, Australia. So welcome from Australia, um, Professor, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to thank everybody for the um, an opportunity to talk to you today. So my presentation is on non-drug treatments for chronic cough. And so this is a hello from Newcastle, Australia. It's the best place in the world to live if anyone wants to come here for a holiday. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Sarah Bone and Professor Peter Gibson, who have been instrumental in a lot of the work I'm talking about. So I've been asked to speak today about effective non-drug treatments. Are there any therapies or exercises that patients can practice at home? Can patients learn to suppress cough and might dietary changes help? So non-drug treatments can include a range of things. I'm going to talk about speech pathology today, but we do have other uh, non-drug treatments that have been discussed in the literature. So speech pathology treatment usually involves uh, four or five sessions with a speech pathologist. And we cover a lot about education on how to control cough. We work on reducing irritation in the throat because often that irritation is the precipitating factor to cough. We teach exercises to control cough symptoms. So when people sense the urge to cough, they can react to that in a way that's not going to cause more problems. And then counselling, because I think as we've heard on the patient videos, it, it's incredibly distressing to have a cough. And I think the personal toll of having cough um, when you're working with it every day, I think we become a bit desensitised to it. So I'd like to thank everyone in the video for highlighting that. So um, in a trial that uh, we did um, some years ago, uh, looking at the efficacy of speech pathology management for chronic cough, we found that 88% of patients who had speech pathology treatment improved, and that was compared with 14% of people who had a placebo treatment. And so what happens with um, chronic cough, as you will have heard, is that there's some sort of irritation Often with the patients we see in speech pathology, the irritation is around the larynx or in the throat. And that irritation leads the person to cough. But the act of coughing itself causes further irritation to the vocal folds. And so the person coughs to relieve that irritation and then that uh, cough causes more ir irritation and we end up in a vicious cycle. And so what we find is um, this slide here shows a picture of the vocal folds and a lot of the work that we're doing in speech pathology is targeting the vocal folds, targeting uh, how to keep the vocal folds healthy, how to reduce irritation and how to stop the vocal folds slamming together in a cough. So when you feel that irritation starting to build, 
uh, how can we respond in a way that's less damaging to COP? And I think this quote is really important, is that the sensation of needing to cough is real, um, but the need to cough is not. So in a lot of people we, who have a chronic refractory cough, there's no benefit to coughing. The cough is a response to irritation. It's annoying, but there's no benefit to coughing. And, and yet that sensation that you need to cough is so very real and so very strong and, and there's a sense of not being able to control it. I should add too that uh, speech pathology treatment for chronic cough is really for people with chronic refractory cough. So it's not a first line treatment for cough. You do really need medical investigation to ensure that everything that needs medical treatment is addressed appropriately. So what can you do at home if you've got a cough um, and, and you're concerned about it, what can you do? Well, I think the first step is to make an appointment with a medical specialist and make sure that the cough is properly investigated and um, make sure that the treatment trials that they recommend, that all of that is followed up. The second thing I would uh, suggest people do is to drink adequate water. Now, what we find a lot of people who come in with chronic cough, I would say at least half of them are not drinking enough water. What we know is if you don't have adequate hydration, the vocal folds have to work harder. For example, in the female voice, the vocal cords vibrate 200 times per second. If you're not drinking enough water, the amount of air pressure that has to build up underneath the vocal folds every time they vibrate increases considerably. So drinking enough water is really important. And also drinking water very frequently is important as well. Also important to try and speak without straining your voice. So if your voice is becoming tired, try not to push it. If you've got a cold or an upper respiratory tract infection, don't push through talking for long periods of time. And we often find that in our patients, talking is one of the big um, triggers for cough. So the more people talk, the more they cough. And so there's something uh, to do with the vocal folds that is a concern. If possible, avoid deliberately coughing and clearing your throat. So if you have an urge to cough, if you can do something other than cough, that's really helpful. Um, we find about 25% of our patients will tell you that they deliberately cough or deliberately clear their throat. And it might sound a little bit strange if you think that they're coming to you because they're coughing, why are they doing it deliberately? But I think the issue is that there's quite strong irritation in the larynx and that, or in the voice box. And the, it's the irritation in the throat that's the big problem. And that's what is making people cough. If you can avoid doing that at all, even if you can cut it down by half, that's very beneficial. Um, if you can avoid excess uh, alcohol and uh, caffeine, um, that's also very helpful. Uh, excess alcohol and caffeine can be very drying on the vocal folds. And so um, that, that can um, also contribute to reflux. Um, I've had patients who've completely eliminated alcohol and completely eliminated caffeine and their cough symptoms have improved remarkably. Um, other patients tell me that's a bit of a drastic cure. So um, can patients learn to suppress a cough? Well, I think they can, and we find that with the results of our treatment. And I think Stuart and Azone's um, work are looking at functional magnetic resonance imaging. And I know Stuart's um, spoken earlier today, um, where he finds that the parts of the brain that control our voluntary movement are also involved in controlling cough. So there is um, brain activation when we cough, if we cough deliberately, if we try to stop ourselves coughing, there are also bits of the brain that are activated. And what we're trying to do in speech pathology treatment is to highlight those um, aspects of the brain that are controlling cough. And here's another diagram 
um, from uh, Brendan Canning's work, just talking about how complex the uh, neural control or the brain control is in COPS. So we've got parts of the, the reflexive um, brain control, controlling COPS, but we've also got these conscious areas. And it's why we can deliberately cough at times and we can also tell ourselves to suppress a cough at other times. It's extremely difficult if you've got a lot of um, stimulation and uh, a lot of hypersensitivity, it's extremely difficult to control a cough. But what we try to work on in therapy is um, improving cough control. So what we want to do, um, this is a diagram where um, we've got on the uh, bottom axis here is time and on this vertical axis, the stimulation of the cough receptors and in a healthy individual, stimulation really needs to reach this line in order for someone to cough. In a person with chronic cough though, they don't need much stimulation for them to cough. They can cough in response to very minor amounts of stimulation. Following speech pathology, what we want to do is raise that threshold. I don't think we get it back to healthy levels, but I think we try to increase it so that people can withstand a little bit more stimulation. But we also want to slow the rate of the stimulation of the cough receptors so that we reduce the irritation in the larynx so that we're not stimulating the cough quite so frequently. And I, I think that's... Um, the way I try to explain it to people, we're trying to reduce stimulation, but also teach control over the cough. So are there diet changes that can help? So just looking at some data um, on the uh, rates of over, overweight and obesity, um, and this is a graph showing um, age groups and overweight obesity in the EU. And this is some data from some of our patients at um, John Hunter Hospital. So uh, the majority of our patients with chronic cough and vocal cord dysfunction um, are overweight or obese. And this is higher than the Australian, the general Australian population. So we're wondering, is there a role of obesity? We need more um, more data to inform us about this. But there is some work being done um, looking at some diet changes in, um, in chronic cough. And so some of the work that Craig Zalvin has done, uh, he's an ENT, otolaryngologist in the US, and he has promoted a Mediterranean style diet, which is primarily plant-based with very small amounts of meat and dairy, significant reductions in these things, um, as well as not lying down uh, after eating, having smaller, more frequent meals, elevating the head of the bed, and uh, sinus hygiene as well. And so what he found is after that program um, that over two thirds of patients improved. Now, what we have to remember, and, and I think Dr. Salvin would be the first to admit this, this is just a very simple study. It's a retrospective review of patients in his own practice. It's not a, a what we call a prospective randomised uh, trial design, but it, it might be something that is helpful for some people. And if people want to explore diet changes, that might be something to consider. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I really I've enjoyed uh, reading all the questions that have come up in the chat. So uh, please keep the questions coming. And if there's something that we don't know, we're very happy to find out for you. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, many thanks, uh, many thanks. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, many people this chronic cough uh, we learned a lot and probably uh, there will be a, a relief of uh, their cough as long as we don't uh, have a really effective medication. I saw a question in the chat, not in the uh, question and answer, um, whether uh, physical therapy and speech uh, therapy uh, should be uh, first line treatment or should be combined with um, uh, with um, a medical uh, treatment, with pharmacological treatment. 
I think uh, you could uh, still answer this question. Uh, we uh, <coughs> uh, edited uh, in Germany a booklet, 80 uh, uh, pages on physical therapy uh, for uh, cough and other respiratory diseases. Uh, which is uh, very good uh, if you have a special trained uh, therapist, uh, but we don't have uh, at yet in the whole country. Uh, and please. So I, I think there's, um, there is certainly, a, 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 it's important, I think, if you're going to undertake uh, physiotherapy or speech pathology treatment for cough, that it is well coordinated with medical treatment. Um, it, it's really important that we're not missing any important diagnosis. And I would hate to teach somebody with lung cancer to suppress their cough and miss the fact that they had lung cancer. So I really um, in, encourage our patients to seek that medical treatment first. I think that in terms of uh, speech pathology, I'm seeing more and more speech pathologists um, learn to manage this condition. And most of those um, people, though, they tend to work a bit more with otolaryngology, ENT clinics, and probably a little bit less with respiratory clinics. But we're starting to see an increase in the um, number of people who are trained to manage it. Um, thank you very much. It was a next question um, that we miss uh, post-nasal drip uh, today. Uh, we call it uh, upper airway cough uh, syndrome. And in fact, we don't have an uh, otorhinolaryngologist here, uh, but I think it is an important cause. Um, in my series uh, decades ago, it was the second uh, most uh, common cause for a chronic cough. And uh, there is some help um, in uh, these cases. Who want to comment this question? Lord Campis. Well, Peter, in my experience, generally, at least the patients that have made their way to my clinic, many of them have been coughing for many years. And while nasal symptoms are prominent, and, and we often, in fact, always try to treat those symptoms, usually that does not result in a successful control of cough. So this, the nasal symptoms settle down, but the cough persists. But I guess this is a, a, a good example of the importance, I think, that Marta stressed and Laurent stressed, is that we should first evaluate common conditions associated with uh, chronic cough. And when those are investigated properly, if they're diagnosed and treated optimally, sometimes, and indeed, uh, you know, not unusually, there is improved uh, control of cough. However, if those conditions are optimally treated and the cough is not controlled, that starts to move us towards patients, which we'll be talking about a little bit later on this morning with what we call refractory chronic cough. But I think the short answer for me really is that that uh, that the initial... Um, I guess, sense that treating post-nasal drip or upper, upper airway cough syndrome would be very effective in uh, most patients hasn't really been the experience, I think, of uh, us specialists working in the field. And that the early success of treatment may have been down to the use of more sedating antihistamine therapies, which, which may have been effective in controlling cough, not locally on the nasal passages, but rather centrally on important areas within the, um, the, uh, the, the higher uh, brain centers. Can I say I think, a word, Peter? Uh, yeah, I think uh, chlorpheniramine, which is not available in Germany, uh, is a good uh, drug to treat uh, such patient uh, that will be uh, will give a little uh, relief and patient with nasal polyps um, if you treat it accordingly i think uh, will benefit as well uh, in uh, um, in cough uh, as well and laurent i think you wanted to say something yes thank you Loken. um yeah post nasal drip is very common in, in patients with chronic cough. Um, but 
um, some patients have normal uh, nasal fibroscopy. Um, so I'm wondering at the moment if uh, those patients have um, um, a normal sensitivity of the larynx and they feel um, secretion um, and um, it's it's not because there is secretion it's because they they have a sensitivity uh, they have a dysfunction in the sensitivity it's it, it it's why I think the the, the treatment doesn't don't work in in, in, in those patients and um, uh, in my opinion it, it's it's a it's an expression of the um, hypersensitivity syndrome and the uh, uh, dysfunction of the, of the perception of um, secretion in, in the throat. But it's my opinion and, and, and we, we need more um, work on, on that. Marta, think... Marta, it would be great to have your thoughts on that. And also, Anne, your, uh, your thought on what Laurent has said around uh, maybe th this, this kind of neural dysregulation uh, being the more likely explanation for that sensation of something at the back of the of the throat. But Marta, first of all, your experience. Uh, thank you, Lorcan. Uh, I mean, uh, I agree with uh, Laurent uh, that uh, in pozal nose grip, uh, there, the, the, there must be a hypersensitivity of uh, 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 calf reflex. But uh, we used to uh, examine uh, most of our patients with chronic cough uh, regularly by ENT and uh, we really see a lot of uh, changes, uh, structural abnormalities uh, in these patients. What's the role of these abnormalities is not sure for me, but from my point of view, I split these patients with upper area cough syndrome into three groups and I usually see some uh, respond to therapies in uh, patients with uh, allergic rhinitis uh, if they are treated in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, topic steroids or antihistamines. And I do see the uh, improvement in patients with real uh, um, chronic uh, rhinocytes, with, especially with polyps. If they are treated, they, they will react to it. But the most of our patients uh, who declared any nasal symptoms were patients with non-allergic uh, rhinitis, chronic rhinitis. And this group do not respond to therapy as good as the both uh, uh, groups uh, w w which I mentioned. So I, I really divide this patient and I try to look a little bit more into the reason of their uh, upper cough syndrome. Uh, and if it's non-allergic, the treatment will be difficult and maybe it's not the first um, actor in this, uh, the, first, uh, the first reason, uh, or maybe just it's a coexisting uh, uh, disease and not the real cup trigger.